Good evening. Tonight, it's my privilege to introduce two Wayland residents, Dr. Alan Marsher and Dr. Svetlana Jorstad, here to tell us about black hole monsters at the centers of galaxies. Professor Marsher is a professor of astronomy, and Dr. Jorstad is a senior research associate in the Institute for Astrophysical Research at BU. Together, they have published over 200 articles in scientific journals on the topic of quasars and other types of active galactic nuclei. They use data from NASA satellite observatories as well as ground-based telescopes to follow variations and changes in images of jets of high energy particles and magnetic fields at the centers of galaxies. And they are part of the team that recently imaged the black hole shadow at the center of the galaxy M87. Two quick notes. First, that this presentation is being filmed by Waycam, so you can catch it again on their channel or on YouTube, and you may see the back of your head. <laughs> and, <laughs> and secondly, I wanted to take this opportunity, given our speakers, to let you know that the library has a telescope, which you can take home and borrow for two weeks, thanks to a generous donor and the Aldrich Astronomical Society, which maintains it for us. So if you want to reserve it, talk to me, or you can also search for it online. And with that, I want to thank Drs. March, Marsher and Jorstad for being here tonight. Please join me in welcoming them to the library. Thank Thanks very much. You'll be hearing from Svetlana uh, in a little while. I'm really glad to be uh, making this presentation to you uh, because, first of all, I'm very enthusiastic about black holes, but also because it's a star-studded winter night tonight, very beautiful sky overhead. And I can see that the, the middle school children, a lot of them have been painting cosmic themes and putting them up, on the, putting them up here on the library wall. So it's a very nice setting to, uh, to be uh, talking about uh, a rather exotic subject, black holes. Okay, so what is a black hole? It, it's, a, I would say, a gift from nature. It's a gift from nature that we didn't know actually existed back when they were conceived of after Einstein uh, developed his theory of gravity called general relativity. Uh, Karl Schwarzschild, a, a, a German physicist, was at the Russian front in World War I, and he worked out in his equations that something like a black hole could exist. And the idea is that if you squeeze enough matter into small enough space, the gravity gets so strong that nothing can escape from it, not even light. And so that's where it gets the name black hole because no light can, uh, can be escaping from it. And so the boundary of the black hole, because you can't see anything coming from inside it, the boundary of the black hole is given the name the event horizon. Okay, well, how big is the event horizon? We can actually write an equation down to calculate that from uh, uh, thanks to this guy, Carl Schwarzschild. Um, it has some mathematical symbols here, but all they are is just the number two times Newton's gravitational constant, which if you've ever taken physics, you've seen, times the mass of the black hole divided by the square of the speed of light. So it just goes directly as the mass of the black hole. Black holes that are more massive are bigger. Well, how big are they? Well, if you take a black hole with the sun's mass, so if you somehow were able to squeeze the sun down to the point where it becomes a black hole, it would have a diameter of six kilometers. So somewhere around the size of downtown Boston. The ones that we see at the centers of galaxies can have masses of a billion or even more times the mass of the sun. And those are about the size of our solar system. It's still very compact by cosmic standards to take a billion solar masses and squeeze it down to the size of our solar system. But it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the real, real tiny size of, of a black hole that has a mass like the sun's mass. One of the great <coughs> cosmic ironies is that this thing that doesn't let light escape can actually create the most luminous things we see in the universe. So creating black holes, black holes where stuff is actively falling in, in fact, can make the brightest things in the universe, the things that are most luminous in the universe. So the idea is that stuff falls in, just like water going down a drain, it has some, uh, some spin to it, and as it goes closer to the drain, it spins faster and faster. The same thing happens to matter falling into a black hole. In this case, the black hole is the drain, 
and what happens is the matter swirls around it on its way falling in. It's from a, a physical principle called conservation of angular momentum. And so the stuff s swirls around as it falls in, forming a disk as it does. And the disk can get extremely hot. So the material just outside the black hole, maybe about three times the event horizon and farther out, can get extremely hot, so hot that it glows in visible light that we can see, but also in ultraviolet light. Also, something that we wouldn't have predicted before we observed it, we find that there are jets of particles that are streaming out from the vicinity of the black hole swallows almost all this matter swirling around it, will get swallowed by the black hole eventually. But some particles, along with magnetic fields, get shot out in the form of jets along the rotational poles of the uh, black hole. So you've got glowing gas that goes into the black hole, and you've got jets of particles and magnetic fields that are shooting out along the poles. And those jets can be extremely, uh, extremely bright. Okay, now there are two kind of classes of black holes. There's black holes that have masses that aren't that much greater than the sun, typically around 10 times the mass of the sun. And then there's black holes that have masses of millions or billions times the mass of the sun that lie at the centers of galaxies. So let's first talk about the ones that are closer to us that have masses more like around 10 times the mass of the sun. These are the remains of very, very massive stars, stars that started out with masses 30, 40, 50, 100 times the, uh, the sun's mass. And the cores of these stars <coughs> will eventually contract when they run out of fuel. They will contract, and they will eventually form a black hole. The rest of the star will explode apart in a uh, super supernova that uh, astronomers have given the name hypernova to. You kind of run out of words. We have a you know, supernova to to for an exploding star, and then you have one that's even a bigger explosion, so we call it the hypernova. Next will be an ultranova, and then will be a hyper-ultranova. <laughs> so, you know, you may be thinking, okay, so some very, very massive stars will make black holes from their centers eventually. It takes them about a million years to go through their life cycle to do that. How many of these black holes are in our galaxy? And are we in danger of these black holes? It's a very valid question. We can actually uh, uh, use our knowledge of the cosmos to estimate the number of these very uh, these uh, massive black holes, the massive stars that became black holes, that have, uh, they've lived and died. And when we make the estimate, we find that the number is actually quite large, about 100 million. There are about 100 million black holes out there in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, that are just going around the center, orbiting around the center of the galaxy, minding their own business until something falls into them. And then when something gets close enough to fall into them, then some fireworks can happen. There are about 40 of these guys where there's another star close enough that we can actually see these fireworks. These are black holes where the star was in a binary system, two stars orbiting around each other, and the more massive star lived and died earlier and eventually formed a black hole. And now that other star is donating mass to the black hole, and as that stuff falls in the black hole, you get this glowing ultraviolet light and x-rays and, and visible light and so on. And these things become very, very bright objects in our galaxy. As I said, there are about 40 of those that we can see, and there are about 100 million that we don't see, 100 million that don't have much falling into them at the moment, and they just sort of orbit around the galaxy. So Let's see, 100 million black holes hanging out there. You know, what's the chances we're going to fall into one? One is that the space is really vast, even just the space in our Milky Way galaxy. Most of these black holes, except for about 40 of them, are starving. Little and no mass is falling in. And because of the hugeness of space, there's near zero chance that we'll run into one for trillions of years. Trillions of years now, you know, most of, our, most of us don't plan to live for trillions of years. So that's, that's probably okay. But this is a probability. This is a probability. And, and I always am a little bit leery when we quote you know, probabilities. Uh, Svetlana had an experience um, when she was uh, visiting, uh, visiting St. Petersburg, Russia, a few years ago. And she was having her nails done, and the, and the woman at the nail salon said, oh, you're an astronomer. What's the danger of, of, uh, of a fairly big comet or asteroid 
hitting St. Petersburg. He says, oh, the probability of it hitting a major city with you know, millions of people is very, very, very low. Don't worry about it. The next day, the meteor <laughs> crashed into Chernobyl, a city of 3 million people in Siberia. <laughs> she doesn't go back to that nail salon when she visits St. Petersburg. <laughs> so the probability may be low, but it's not zero. And, and so uh, if, uh, I don't want to see any lawsuits if, uh, if, one <laughs> if the black hole appears on the horizon anytime soon. There is, though, besides these 10 times the mass of the sun black holes in various parts of our galaxy, at the center of our galaxy, there's a monster one that is, has a mass of four million times the mass of the sun. What you're seeing here is a kind of a cartoon made from actual orbits of stars that you can see with infrared telescopes. Now, in visible light, we can't see the center of our galaxy. There's too much dust in the way. But in infrared light, the kind of light that rattlesnakes can see through their pits, but we, our eyes aren't sensitive to. Um, in infrared light, we can actually follow the orbits of these stars. And so this is going to replay again. And so watch the orbit of this guy, for example. Zoom. I see it's orbiting around something that is, is just, we don't see it. We just see a, a star there showing what its position is. That's the center of our galaxy. It's in constellation Sagittarius, and they call it Sagittarius A star. It was first, uh, first detected in radio light, uh, actually by my thesis advisor, Bob Brown, and, and a colleague of his who, uh, who found this radio source at the center of the galaxy. That, uh, that everything here is orbiting around. Now, astronomers from the size of an orbit and how long it takes for it to, a star to complete the orbit can tell what the mass is that is going around, how much mass is, is, uh, is contained in this thing in the star. And the calculation shows that the, the orbits are so fast that there has to be four million times the mass of the sun in a little tiny region at the center of our galaxy. Now, if you put that much mass at, this, at a little tiny region, gravity will contract it to become a black hole. So we're, we're sure that there's a black hole there at the center of our galaxy with a mass about 4 million times the mass of the sun. So what's going to happen to that guy? Well, fortunately, it's not well, very well fed. You see some flashes of infrared light, flashes of x-rays, and there probably would be, if we could see visible and ultraviolet light uh, through the dust, there would be flashes of, of visible and ultraviolet light as well. But nearly not too much. And the reason why is that it's fairly starved. Not much is falling in. And I suggest we don't feed it. We don't want to see what happens when it falls in. Because I'll show you what happens when you have a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy where a lot of stuff is falling into it. There's an example. There's, if you take a long exposure, you see a nice round looking galaxy kind of galaxy we call an elliptical galaxy because in general they have slightly <laughs> different from round shapes. Uh, there's a huge number of stars here in this hand. That they're all blended together when you take the image. If you take a shorter exposure image, though, you can see this thing coming out of the nucleus. Here's a, the nucleus here. Where's the Hubble? Here's the Hubble Space Telescope observation. So here's the image from the Hubble Space Telescope. There's a the center of the thing, and you see this thing looking like a jet coming out of it. Well, that's one of these particle jets I told you about that black holes can have when stuff is falling into them. There's another one that's pointing in the opposite direction, but we can't see it because it's beaming its radiation in the opposite direction. It's kind of like a uh, uh, halogen flashlight that beams its, its light in the forward direction. And so this, this uh, jet is kind of pointing, not exactly at us, but almost, almost at us. And so it appears much brighter than the jet going in the other direction. And this is jet is made out of very high energy particles, electrons and protons, and strong magnetic fields. And that produces very uh, intense light that we can see. So then what about this black hole? This, uh, this uh, galaxy is actually not close to us by our standards, but by galaxy standards it is. It's about 50 million light years away. 50 million light years, well our galaxy is, is about uh, uh, somewhere around 70 or so light years across, if you just go by the visible light. Uh, 70,000 light years across, I should say. And so it's, 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 it's actually quite far outside the Milky Way. And this, this is a galaxy in the constellation Virgo. It's actually in the center of a cluster of galaxies. There are a lot of galaxies that are in its, its a group that it belongs to. 
So it's about uh, 50 million light years away. Well, how about its black hole? With Hubble Space Telescope observations, actually they can have seen the motions of stars at the center of the galaxy. And they infer that at the center of the galaxy is a black hole with a mass of six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. Six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. Well, that got astronomers thinking. They said, okay, now if it's six and a half billion times the mass of the sun, maybe, maybe we can get an image of that guy, of what's going on around the black hole. And that's what Svetlana is going to talk about now. and uh, all astronomers for long time. Close, yeah, close to it. Now it is better? So it is better? Yes. Okay. So, but uh, nobody has seen a black hole until the last year. And uh, now I will talk about the event horizon collaboration, which got a first image of the black hole, which was released in April 2019. Uh, really, the event horizon um, telescope uh, collaboration was formed in 2016, in uh, autumn 2016, <coughs> at the conference here in uh, Massachusetts in Cambridge. And now it has more than 200 members. They are from 18 countries, different countries, and they are from 37 different institutes and universities. Here <coughs> you see kind of the map of the institution where uh, members of the HD collaboration are. It is North America, it is uh, Chile, Europe, and Asia. Um, so the <coughs> the general theory of relativity predicts that uh, the space near a black hole should be perfect. And uh, a ray of rays of light should be bent when they pass near a black hole, as you see here. And an image of a black hole should look as a very bright ring of light with a black circle in the center. So this black circle is called shadow of a black hole. And it is about five times larger than the Schwarzschild radius was, wa which Alan introduced previously. So, so that uh, astronomers try to find the best candidates to image the black a block a black hole shadow, and here uh, they really look at many many. It was a kind of survey at many many massive galaxies, nearest massive galaxies, and found that the most promising are these four sources. One of them it is Sagittarius A star. It is the center of our galaxy, Alan talked talk about this, and M87, which he shows also, and also uh, Sombrero galaxy, which is known as M104, and also Centaur A galaxy, which is here. Uh, here you see masses estimated on base of a star motion around as Alan uh, show you in the case of Sagittarius A. And you see that masses are changing from uh, several millions of uh, solar masses to several billions of solar masses. And these are distances, they are in megapascals. 
it is very common we are doing it in astronomy one megaparsec it is about three million of uh, uh, <coughs> light uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah light of <laughs> years so so that here sagittarius a it is about 26000 light years and here for m87 it is about 55 million light years so these two are the best candidates to look for a black hole shadow because if you look at angular size of a one Schwarzschild radius for these two sources, they are the biggest, about 10 microarcseconds or about eight microarcseconds. But for the shadow, it is about five times more. So that it is about 50 microarcseconds and here about 40 microarcseconds. But it is very small value because for a hum reasons, I would like to say that uh, best resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, it is about 0 0.1 arc second, not micro arc seconds. So that to observe really this shadow, we should have a resolution about 20 micro arc seconds, which is about 10 times <coughs> better than Hubble Space Telescope. So it was clear that only radio interferometry can reach such a um, uh, fine resolution. So that this you see uh, a telescope which participated in observation in April 2017 for uh, <coughs> Event Horizon Telescope. It is eight telescopes which are located in Hawaii, in Arizona, in Mexico, in Chile, in Spain, and even in the South Pole. So some of them, for example, this is, it is Atacama Large Millimeter Telescope uh, Array. It is really array of telescopes, hundreds of telescopes, and they will face together to work as one telescope. The same it was for the SMA. It is, uh, <coughs> it is sub-millimeter array uh, in Hawaii. They also were phased together to work as a one telescope. And after that, all these eight telescopes were synchronized to look at the same object to get such a fine resolution as 20 mic micro arc seconds because your resolution depends on the largest distance between the telescope which you have. And for this kind of system of telescope, the largest distance was more than 10,000 kilometers. But even with such a big, what they call uh, baseline in the case of VLBI or it is radio interferometry techniques. Uh, you need to have a fairly observed fairly short wavelength, radio wavelength, about one millimeter to get resolution of 20 micro arc seconds. And uh, have not been previously observation at one millimeter because it is very difficult to do due to our atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is very unstable at one millimeter. So that it was really pioneering uh, observation. So uh, now I will show you uh, how does VLBI technique works. Really, in this case, very important to use a rotation of our Earth because in this case, as Earth rotates and telescopes move in some kind of uh, uh, celestial um <coughs> system of coordinates, you will have more points 
from which you look at your source. And you will have a finer resolution. So that it is really very important to have a rota to use rotation of our Earth to get a very, very good resolution of a source. After observation, which happens in April from April 6 to April 12 for a week, and uh, really the event horizon collaboration was very lucky with the weather. The weather was, it is difficult to imagine you saw this, the side of telescope were very different from each other, but the weather was fairly good at all sides, mm -hmm. so that it was really amazing. And uh, uh, th uh, the next step was to collect the data. But it was also a very difficult task because at each telescope, it was huge amount of data. It was 100 petabytes. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine, if you know megabytes, gigabytes, it was disk of 100 petabytes. And besides that, uh, the data from South Pole could not be delivered during a half of year, or uh, yes, half of year, because observation was in April when it was uh, in, uh, in South Pole, it was autumn. After that, there was winter, there were no communications, and even, and only when a navigation started, the disk from the South Pole came to, for the data to be reviewed. The next step with it was uh, the data reduction and how it's possible to get image sheets. So we, there were formed four different teams of uh, astronomers from also from different, um, different countries and you see here uh, these four teams, they each have a name and each has some kind of uh, different methods. Uh, there was team one and team two, which both used the, uh, the method of maximum likelihood to uh, get images from the data which were collected. But they used different programs. Uh, different rea realization of this method of maximum likelihood. And uh, there was cross-Atlantic team, Alan and I, we belonged to this team and participated in this team to make images. And there was East Asian team. We both, team three, team four, used some kind of traditional methods to get images. It is traditional method based on clean method, which is based on Fourier transformation. And this uh, uh, method of uh, clean method using Fourier transformation, it uh, really is uh, uh, written in software BIFMAP, which is special software <laughs> to reduce uh, radio interferometry data. So, there was organized in the block, uh, Black Hole Initiative Center, if you know that there is a CFA here in Cambridge, the Black Hole Initiative Center. So uh, there was organized a workshop where people from, uh, uh, scientists from all four teams were invited for a week. We were put to, to work with the data when all data arrived and calibrated. We were put in different offices so that we could not communicate with each other, only within each team. And we worked though for a week to get images without communication with other teams. And after that, in the end, we compared the images which we got. And here you see these three different, this is 
team three and four together because we use the same software deep map. And this is, is uh, team one and this is team two. We have not seen before what this meeting on July 24, which was the last day of our workshop, these images. So that we were very glad that we have almost the same kind of images. You of course see that maybe brightness is a little bit different of this kind of uh, circle, but it is look as a black hole shadow. <laughs> so, and we kind of celebrate it. It is the all four teams, four, all four teams together. So, and then, uh, and then we started to analyze the image which we got to determine the size of the uh, black circle inside. And also we uh, reduced other data from, uh, uh, this was the, we, uh, during that workshop, we reduced the data only from one day, but there, there are data from other days. And they should, if it is a black hole shadow, they should look completely the same for all days because it is not possible to have variability for, uh, for the <coughs> black hole because the, this depends on the mass of black hole cannot change on a uh, small time scale. So, and uh, after that we, I said, analyze the image which we got to get parameters of the circle which we see. And we found that this, the diameter of the uh, ring is about 42 microseconds plus minus three. Uh, then there was the next part when we should kind of do theoretical simulation. Uh, on the first mm, picture which I showed you, uh, the circle of light was completely uniform. But uh, which we found, as uh, you saw, it had some brightness in the bottom. So really, computer simulations uh, predicted that there should be some difference in the brightness of the ring, which is connected with beaming of light uh, from orbital motion of plasma around the black hole. So that the light should not be uniform. There should be difference in the light around the circle, black circle. After that, there were a lot of simulation. Really, theorists uh, in the EHT collaboration. They created a library of uh, synthetic images, about 60,000 of uh, uh, synthetic images. And here on the top, you see with different parameters of black hole mass, of black hole spin, what we did not talk about uh, that, but there are black holes which don't rotate and there are black holes which rotate and uh, it and it is called spin of black hole. So here you see some kind of simulated data, but it is ideal. And here it is the same simulated data when they, they are blurred with really that resolution which we have with the HT telescope. And you see that this simulated data looks similar to what uh, we really observed with the HT telescope. And <clears throat> this kind of comparison between theory and simulation and observation uh, gives that, uh, that the, in the such a circle, such a shadow we can get if the really 
in the center of M87, there is a black hole with a mass about 6.5 billion times of sun mass. And it means also, uh, because it was put in simulation, that the general theory of uh, relativity works. So it has one another test that we really got, we, we observed this image and got a simulated image using the general theory uh, of re relativity. So, so that this is a success. <laughs> so what really we now can image a black hole. It is only for one source now, because for others, you can imagine, I showed you the best candidate, <laughs> and it's M87 for now is the best. But we will improve. Maybe we will go even uh, to the space, and we will have larger baseline and even better resolution. So it is confirmed that this uh, monster in the center of uh, massive galaxies, they are black holes and they have event horizon. And also what we see between comparison between observation and theory, that black holes are relatively simple and theoretists can really predict their properties. Really to the same conclusion came uh, physicists who really observed gravitational waves and predicted their behavior on base of merging of uh, black holes. So uh, this result was released on April 10, 2019. And on April 11, <laughs> all, all, each uh, kind of prominent newspaper in the world publish an image of uh, the black hole. And it is really a collage which one of our member of our HD collaboration <laughs> created. So it is all, even not all, but majority of newspapers in the world on April 11. And it is articles about the uh, black hole shadow image. And it is different languages and from different side of the world. And now I will give our <laughs> the next possibility to speak. Okay, so I, I want to, uh, to spend a little while now um, to talk about what we specifically do at Boston University when we're not uh, making a, the, uh, this uh, event horizon telescope images. We have a very full program to observe, uh, ob observe the black holes at the centers of galaxies. And the, uh, the kind of object that Svetlana and I like to focus on is a kind of quasar that's called a blazar. Now what a quasar is, it's a center of a galaxy that's like so far away you can't really see the galaxy very well. The Hubble Space Telescope can barely make out the galaxy. But the center of the galaxy is extremely luminous, much more luminous than all the stars in the galaxy put together. And when you look at one of these guys from a great distance, these things you can see out to billions of light years. Uh, here's a negative image, so all the stars look, look like black dots. And this looks like a star, right? But it's not. This is the center of a galaxy that has a, a black hole of a mass of about a billion times the mass of the sun, where lots of stuff is falling in all the time into the black hole. And so these are one of the, the kinds of black holes where we see jets coming out. Here is a, in a Hubble Space Telescope image of one of these guys. Uh, now these spikes here are just spikes that are come from the, uh, the, the imaging process. It's from the kind of support structure of the telescope. You see that when you get something bright in your image. But this thing sticking out here is one of these jets of high energy particles I talked about, high energy particle magnetic field. You can see the visible light here. Again, it's a negative image, so the dark stuff is really bright. And also you can see in x-rays with a Chandra x-ray uh, observing teles uh, orbiting telescope. You can see the jet there. And if we look with this radio interferometry technique, VLBI, that Svetlana talked about, uh, we can make out 
the jet as well. But you can also see when we look at it with, uh, with this very, very high resolution, you can see that there's stuff moving inside the jet. And, w and one of the amazing things, this was uh, discovered in the 1970s, one of the amazing things is that the stuff appears to move faster than the speed of light. Now Einstein said the speed of light is the absolute limit uh, for motion in the universe, and he's right. It does seem to be the absolute limit of motion, but you can get illusions that things appear to move faster than light. And the illusion comes when something is moving almost in our direction, a little bit off from our direction, at a speed very, very close to the speed of light, then it can appear to move faster than light because it keeps getting closer to us and it takes less and less time for its uh, radio waves to get to us. So, uh, so it gives you the illusion because that it, it, essentially its time isn't the same as your time, as our time. And so we get the illusion it's moving faster than light when it's, when it's really only going very close to the speed of light. But still we're talking about speeds that are 0.995 times the speed of light, 99.5% the speed of light. So they're extremely fast. And when things go that fast, they, as I said before, they are like halogen flashlights. They beam their light into our direction. And so we pick out these objects, these blazars that have jets pointing almost right at us, look extremely bright to us. They don't look so bright to other people in the universe, other creatures in the universe. And there are presumably other jets that are pointing toward them that they seem to be very, very bright. So when we look at, at blazars, we're looking at the jets that are pointing almost right at us from galaxies that are very, very distant and have black holes with about a billion times the mass of the sun that are very well-fed black holes, very well-fed monsters at the centers of the galaxies. Now, these, uh, these things are really bright, not in visible light that we can see. They're, you can see them, but they're not really that bright in visible light. But in gamma rays, the highest energy form of light, which, which our eyes aren't sensitive to, uh, they're the brightest things you can see outside of the Milky Way. When you look uh, away from the Milky Way in the sky, these are the brightest things you can see in gamma rays and also in microwaves at, uh, at millimeter wavelengths. They're the brightest things that, that you can see. So this thing is a, uh, what's shown here is a movie made by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. There's a movie of gamma rays in the sky. The, the Milky Way is around the edge. So we're looking at the northern half of the sky, the northern uh, 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 galaxy. Let's see if I can get it to move again. There it is. And this is taken over a three-month period. And so she sees these things turning on and off flashing and so on, those are blazars. Those are very, very distant galaxies with jets pointing almost right at us, and they, they flash in gamma rays for a few weeks at a time. See them turning on and off. So the Milky Way galaxy is right around the edge here. See some of the Milky Way gamma ray sources here. And here, this thing going here, that's the sun. The sun is a, a not terribly strong, but it's a, it's a source of gamma rays as well, and it appears to move across the sky. So if we had gamma ray eyes, or if we had microwave eyes, then actually blazars instead of stars would be the things that we would uh, uh, be gazing at at night. Okay, so going back to the cartoon that I had earlier on, what we're looking at is we're looking almost straight down one of these jets when we look at a blazar. So what Svetlana and I like to do besides making images of shadows of the black holes, is we like to look at these jets and see wh what's going on. It, it, it's kind of amazing that you have uh, a, a black hole that's drawing everything into itself that's actually shooting out these particles along the poles and try to figure out what's going on there. And, and one of the ways that we can, uh, we can explore it is not just through these images that I've been showing you, that Svetlana showed you and that I showed you with the, uh, the apparent faster than light motion, but also we can look at changes in the brightness. And so here's a graph of changes in brightness in gamma rays, in visible light, in x-rays, and microwaves. So every time you see it go up, that's, that's a real bright outburst of, of light. And you see that sometimes the outbursts of light happen at right around the same time in gamma rays, visible light, x-rays, and, uh, and in microwaves. And so we like to study that and, and try to figure out to combine this information with the information we get from the images, and we make images every month of these guys, we try to figure out what's going on inside there. And so, uh, so we have, uh, uh, I don't think I'd be bragging if I said that, that uh, I'd actually be telling you the truth, that we have the, the most advanced uh, uh, study of this type going on at Boston University with our group.
So what we're trying to do is you're trying to study the jets as close to the black hole as possible. Uh, this shows an uh, artist's rendition of what the theorists say is what's going on, and that is that uh, the stuff orbiting around the black hole, oops, sorry, the stuff orbiting around the black hole is dragging magnetic field around with it and twists up the magnetic field. And it's like twisting up a wire. If you twist up a wire enough, then it becomes like a spring. You know, those of you who've had you know, these, uh, you know, something stuck inside your, your sink or toilet or some of that, and you get, a, get out one of these metal things called a snake, you twist it, twist it, twist it until it finally springs down the, uh, down the pipe and clears it out. That's similar to what goes on here, except the magnetic field corresponds to the, uh, to the wire that gets twisted up. And when it gets twisted up, the magnetic field, when it springs out, it springs out at speed very close to the speed of light, because that's the natural speed of uh, electric and magnetic fields. And so it shoots this stuff out, the particles out at very close to the speed of light, and the particles in the magnetic field go out th there, and then the p high energy particles moving in the magnetic fields and make all this light that we see. Okay, so here's an example of, of our observations. Uh, this is the one I showed you before. We see the apparent faster than light motion of this thing. We, we actually call these things blobs. It's our, uh, the, the term. We, we, if we write a paper in a journal, we usually use a, the more uh, sedate word not, you know, might not of emission. But when we talk about it to each other, we talk about blobs. And at the, at the end of one of them is, a, uh, is something called the core, which is a, a stationary bright spot. And then upstream of that is the black hole. So you got the black hole here. You've got the stuff, the, the jet pointing outward. We can start seeing the jet somewhere around a light year away from the black hole. And then we see this, this stuff moving down the jet at speed that appears to be faster than light, but it's really about 99.5% the speed of light. We can even tell what direction the magnetic field is in by measuring the polarization of the light. So that's another, another thing that we, uh, uh, piece of information that we get. And we can make movies out of it. Because we get images once a month, we can make movies out of it, and we can see what's going on when we see these outbursts of gamma rays, or outbursts of visible light, or microwave light. We can see what's going on in the jet. And so here's an a, a example of a jet that's going to re reset in a second. As Svetlana made a movie out of our, uh, our imaging, our images of it. You're going to start again, or you're going to make me into a liar? Wants me to start it up again. Okay, so here's it, it back at this time, and you'll see that is when the gamma rays start to have a big outburst in gamma rays, that's when a new blob is being made. So you see a new blob being made that corresponds. Now we're here, now it's kind of uh, things have died down, but now you're going to get another blob when you get another burst of gamma rays, another blob starting to come out. So that's one of the things that we discovered by, by putting all this data together is that. Uh, these very bright gamma ray outbursts that you saw on that map of the gamma ray sky, those very bright gamma ray outbursts are caused by new blobs coming down the jet, which is caused, we think, by disturbances near the black hole, where or stuff falling in the black hole creates some kind of instability or something and, and shoots some extra energy down the black hole. So, so that's just a, a short uh, uh, description of what we're doing at Boston University. It's, it's a very, uh, very involved set of investigations because we have to get data from the uh, very long baseline array of these radio dishes scattered around the globe. We get data from the NASA satellites like the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope that gets us the uh, gamma ray data. The uh, X-ray uh, uh, light that we, uh, I showed before, we get that from the SWIFT satellite and from other satellites. Uh, the NICER satellite and the New Star satellite, we're getting data from those. And visible light, Svetlana goes, uh, um, or one of our students goes every month for about a week or so to uh, Arizona to observe on uh, one of Boston University's telescopes out there to get the visible light to see how that changes. And in microwaves, we get that from these, uh, from these images and from some of our colleagues who observe in microwaves. So we have this huge, huge amount of data that, uh, that we have on about three dozen objects that we, uh, we observe, three dozen of these blazars that we observe to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on in there. So uh, I think we're making headway in trying and figuring all this stuff out, but uh, it's, it's been a, uh, and we involve a, a quite a few students, graduate students and undergraduate students in our research uh, to make the images. So I want to uh, leave you with a little bit of music here. This is a, an artist's rendition. I don't know if you can hear it. Doesn't seem to be coming out. Okay, well, this is supposed to be Beethoven's Fifth Symphony playing along with us. Anyways, this is an artist's rendition of what goes on. Here's the, the accretion disk of, uh, of gas that's swirling toward the black hole. And here's the disturbance of the black hole that shoots out a blob. Here's a blob moving down the jet. 
and making things very bright. I think uh, another one's going to be coming out here. And so this is essentially, this, this uh, um, artist movie was made from our data, from, uh, based on our data of, of what we uh, have inferred is going on for almost a day. There's a big thing going out. Another thing about the, there's another one first going out here. So when, when these blobs go out, that's when you get all these gamma rays and other, other uh, uh, outbursts of light. Okay, well, I'm, I'm disappointed the music didn't come out, so I'm going to play some of my own music. Uh, my lectures, when I teach, um, graduate students can sit for a while. They have a, a, a fairly good attention span. But when I teach the introductory classes for the non-science majors, uh, their attention span doesn't quite extend over the, uh, the 75 minutes of a typical class. And so I like to entertain them a little bit to, uh, to wake them. But I don't like to entertain them in a, in a way that doesn't support the, uh, the lesson that we're giving. So what I have is I've written some songs for my class that go along with the, uh, with the different lessons. And so I don't know if you can see in the back, see the lyrics, but I hope maybe I'll be able to sing clearly enough so that you can... Uh, I'm going to move, move the microphone so that uh, I have a little bit more space here. Okay, I have two versions of this song. One is, one is uh, pretty much for Valentine's Day that I'm not going to sing here. It's a <laughs> I've had a dean tell me I can't sing it to the undergraduate students. It's a little too risque. Uh -huh. I mean, all it is just just pretending that some of the words that go along with the, uh, the science of blazars uh, uh, can be applied to human, uh, human romance. Uh, so anyways, you can imagine where that, that might come in here. If I just, so I've just changed a few words to, uh, to make it uh, so that undergraduates can be allowed to hear it without me getting into any trouble. Attracted by strong gravity, the mass is so compact, pulling you inward, prepare for close contact, no strength to resist, spinning out of control, falling toward the abyss, approaching the black hole. Full of twisting magnetism, Feeling hot inside, bursting forth with energy, ready for a high-speed ride. Acceleration growing, focusing the beam. The jet starts flowing, plasma shoots downstream. Going closer, faster, closer, faster, closer, faster. Twisted field, magnetic spring. Propulsion! I'm a superluminal blazar, emission beamed into the night. Check out my relativistic jet, it seems faster than the speed of light. I'm beaming as a blazar into your line of sight. Hop in my relativistic jet, let's go faster than the speed of light. Don't mind the illusions, it's just relativity. Pardon the intrusions into the naked singularity. Enjoy the time dilation. Relax and take it slow. Beam the radiation, make the central engine glow. I shine as a quasar with brilliant intensity, powered by the black holes, ultra strong gravity. I get energized with a shockwave, I feel turbulent inside. The magnetic attraction just can't be denied. 
Going closer, faster, closer, faster, closer, faster. I'm your super luminal blazer, emission beam to the night. Check out my relativistic jet, it seems faster than the speed of light. I'm beaming as a blazer into your line of sight. Hop in my relativistic jet, let's go faster than the speed of light. Let's go faster, faster, faster than the speed of light. Thank you. Svetlana, stand up. Thanks very much. You've been very attentive. Okay, now we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. It's out of the Milky Way, yeah. The sun, the, 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 the sun, no, the the the, uh, the, the sun is about uh, about twenty five, tw twenty seven thousand light years. Uh, yeah, well, it's, 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 but, but somewhere close between twenty five and thirty uh, thousand light. We use parsecs. That's why I was to translate twenty five to thirty thousand parsecs away from the Earth, light years away from the center of our galaxy. So our galaxy is actually, we're about two-thirds of the way out in, in our galaxy. Uh, it looks like we're at the center because the, the dust kind of makes like a fog. The dust in the Milky Way kind of makes like a fog. And so the Milky Way doesn't look like it changes its brightness too much around. Do, do we understand the speed you sent on the galaxy? With the visible light. With the visible light. Yeah. Only Nisa or Echo or Radio. Back there. It, it, it's stable over a reasonable amount of time, uh, meaning you know millions, billions, trillions of years. Uh, Stephen Hawking showed that over an infinite amount of time, it's not that that uh, black holes, uh, because of of the the weirdness of things on small scales, you can uh, the black hole will slowly, slowly disintegrate as it makes particles and antiparticles at its uh, event horizon, <coughs> and and s it, when it makes a particle antiparticle pair, one of them can escape. And that process, uh, so, so it's kind of the, the marriage of gravity and, and quantum mechanics uh, it's, it's makes things weird. Repelling. Yeah, yeah, the black holes evaporate. Yeah, he, he nicknamed it evaporation. So, so over extremely long time, black holes uh, are supposed to eventually ev evaporate. But, but over any other, any normal time scale, even billions of years, they're stable. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> That's actually under, under a really great debate. Uh, none of the, none of the uh, ideas uh, agrees with all the data, and so we're gonna, you know, trying to collect more data to, to, to figure that out. There, there are two th ways it could do it. It could do it by having a bunch of smaller black holes than coalesce, and we are seeing black holes coalescing with the gravitational wave uh, observations, uh, but those are like 30 solar mass, 20 solar mass black holes. It would take a long time to get a billion solar mass black hole doing that. And it's thought that there's not enough time that's gone by, in the, uh, even though the universe is almost 14 billion years old. It's not enough time to accumulate a supermassive black hole that way. So another way is, is just to just have a whole bunch of stuff just fall in, you know, that was originally gas, just fall in. Uh, but that doesn't work very well either. So, uh, so, so we're trying to get more data to, to have the data push us to try to figure out what's going on. But it's a really, really good question. Yeah. I'm just curious, I have read that uh, some people think black holes might be formed by the fusion of the core and one galaxy. Yeah. Where, yeah. The, where the two centers of the black holes will then go off and collide together and aggregate. Yeah, in, in fact, the, the problem I have with that is that the universe is expanding. How are our galaxies uh, able to collide? Yeah, the, uh, if things are far enough apart, the expansion will keep them from ever coming together. But if they're not too far apart, gravity actually will, will overcome it. So like you're not expanding, I'm not expanding, the solar system isn't expanding, and our galaxy isn't expanding. Even our local group of galaxies, we have a, a group of around 50 or 60 galaxies, that's not expanding either. Outside of that, everything's moving away from us. So, um, so on, 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 the, uh, on the scales where gravity can make a difference, 
then the expansion universe isn't enough to spread things out. Gravity will, will defeat it. That's how we think the, ga the galaxies formed in the first place, is that even though it was expanding, gravity w was strong enough in local regions to, uh, to make the galaxies. More likely to happen in the tropics of galaxies. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, it was all—it was all technical. It was um, needed to upgrade the um, uh, upgrade the uh, electronic systems of the uh, of the antennas of the uh, radio dishes that were involved. Um, need to wait for yeah, re the receivers and stuff. It need need to, to wait for a couple of them to be completed. <laughs> that was that was very helpful too. Uh, so you have more more of the radio dishes. Uh, you really the uh, image improves greatly as you add more add more dishes. So we're you know the, the collaboration is in the process of adding e even more uh, dishes and having good weather. As Svetlana said, that was uh, that was also very important. Um, but also uh, getting the uh, uh, the system for recording the data. Uh, you want to have a system that can record data from as wide a bandwidth as possible, and and uh, that was also. Uh, improved, so it, it took uh, tens of millions of dollars of, of equipment to, uh, to to optimize things. Yeah. Another real good question. I don't want to answer. <laughs> we're actually no, we're actually been working on that. We, we've been working on it uh, now for 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 months. Yeah, but uh, the problem is that uh, the center of our galaxy uh, changes very quickly on time scale of hours so that it is very difficult to do image when flux change no brightness of souls changes now that but the, the uh, also things probably move around too so so we're we're trying to overcome that but have not succeeded yet uh, but uh, yeah I, I know some of some of the uh, uh, journals like uh, like the journal science and, and nature uh, put down as things to look for in 2020 is the first image from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, the first image of our galactic center is <laughs> a black hole. And we're not sure we're going to be able to produce it. Yeah. Um, when can we see the galaxy or the uh, the, the, the big problem right now is, is uh, more for uh, visible light astronomy, where, it's, where you know, SpaceX is going to be sending up huge number of small satellites. But SpaceX, uh, having been alerted by astronomers that that might be a bit of a problem for us, uh, they are uh, now seeing if they can paint them black and that will, uh, that will uh, uh, keep them from you know, having really absorbing material to, to see if that can keep it from being a, a problem for astronomers. Uh, for, the, for the microwave, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a huge problem until the space junk gets enough that it can destroy an antenna in space. Uh, so, so, so we'll see with that. But yeah, so it's not, not affecting the Event Horizon Telescope uh, project at this point. Yes. Um, well, no. I mean, what, what, what you see, you you see it bending the path of starlight around yeah. it. Yeah. We need to have something near to see a black hole. So, so you see something like the black hole shadow, right? You you see this this uh, this kind of black spot with uh, with stars, and 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 you would have, as it moves through space, you'll see the different stars being having their their apparent position change. So. Yeah, that, that that's thin enough that it'd have to be going through a pretty good cloud, a pr pretty dense cloud, in order to be able to to see that very well. I think uh, the the ones that are bright are are having the the matter donated to them by other stars that they're in, in a binary orbit with. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, something that with that small a mass, the interstellar matter wouldn't be enough to make it light up uh, any significantly. But, but in general, with gravitational waves. Small black holes, there are around, and there are many of them. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can you have another question? Yeah. So the theories about why we got to that point, if it if it wasn't the rain, they they play a big role, and uh, it's it's and we're not really clear on exactly how it works. The mass of the black hole at the center of a galaxy is directly proportional to the mass of the part of the galaxy that kind of makes a, a football shape or sphere, spherical shape. See, our galaxy has a disk. The Milky Way is, is the disk. But there's also a, 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 a big thing called a halo. And, and so if you look at a galaxy like, like M87, the one where we got the black hole shadow from, that's almost completely this halo. It's, 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 almost, it's essentially a spherical distribution. doesn't have any disk, really. Um, and then a galaxy like ours has a disk, plus it has this, this halo. The black hole mass is proportional to the mass of this halo. Exactly why, we're not sure. It's just thought that, well, maybe what happens is that when the black hole forms, then stuff falls into the galaxy, makes lots of stars, and adds to the mass of the galaxy, and then it also some of it falls in the black hole. The black hole gets, ex gets uh, excited and makes these jets and stuff, which then blows out the gas and doesn't allow it to gr the galaxy to grow any further. Then things become quiet, and later on some more stuff falls into the galaxy and the black hole and so on, so that there's some kind of control. The, the black hole system can control the growth of the galaxy. But we're getting that to work in detail, for the, the theorists get it to work in detail. It, it's not really, it doesn't really work that well. So, so it, it's again one of those things that's the frontier of what we're trying to understand. Yeah. That's a real good question. Yes, they're, they're actually they're, the densities are embarrassingly low. You, you like you think of a black hole, you know, it should be this extremely dense thing. Well, that is true for for something about the, the mass of the sun or ten times the mass of the sun. But one of these huge ones that's the size of Pluto's orbit. Uh, yeah, the density is is really quite low. Yeah, yeah, the mass is really high. The density is low, but the gravity is really high. The gravity is really strong because of the huge mass. But 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 you're you're right that the density is not uh, it's 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 it's, it's uh, one of these huge guys. The density is not high at all. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the, the thing is that the gravity the gravity goes as as one divided by the distance squared, whereas the density goes as the as the size. Is more of a size cube, so they, they kind of vary in, the, in different ways mathematically, and and so so you can still have very strong gravity when something isn't very dense, as long as that within that region where there's a huge huge mass. Yeah, the, the source of the light is, uh, is uh, high-energy electrons that are uh, moving in the magnetic fields. I, is it plasma, like a sun, like mm. a star shining? No, no, oh. it, it, it's light like in a, in a uh, high-energy physics lab. High-energy phys high physics, you know, like the, uh, the, the CERN particle accelerator. Um, uh, is it only the electrons, protons? That so yeah, that makes light. In, in, in yes, fact, it makes light. In fact, that, that bothered the heck out of when they, that they first made the first particle accelerators. Uh, it, was, it was a real problem that uh, they, they kept the particles kind of to stay in the accelerator with magnetic fields because the particles were far around the magnetic field. But when they did that, they gave off a lot of light. They made a lot of light, and that they lost energy. And the, what they wanted was really high energy particles going to the magnetic field. They wanted so, so, and they called it synchrotron radiation because the particle accelerator they're using, they, they nicknamed it a synchrotron. And so, th so that's the term we use for this light. We call it synchrotron radiation. And it's from high energy particles that are moving in magnetic fields. Yeah. motion of plasma around the black hole. And due to motion, the light, when it goes to us, it is becomes brighter, it is dim. And when it goes out of us, it becomes weaker. Yeah, so, so part of it is orbiting in our direction. Yes. But th then, of course, how, it, how we see it depends on the orientation of the galaxy. So, so the effect you're talking about with the orientation of the galaxy is there as well. 
So it's a combination of the two. Okay. We have a, I don't you've asked one before. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, they, uh, th that was one of the guesses, that what might be the dark matter. This is matter that must exist out there ha because we see, we see matter that has gravity, but we can't see it. We, we, we see the effects of its gravity, but we can't see it. For example, clusters of galaxies are held together, but there's not enough mass in all the galaxies and stars, all the stars in the galaxies, to hold it together, given how fast all the galaxies move. So there has to be some dark matter. And the idea that black holes supply that dark matter is, was, is, was uh, you know, a possibility. But if that were the case, then you would expect uh, this, one of my answers to, to another question, is you would expect to see the bending of light around those black holes. So they've looked for that. They've looked for the effects of bending light around black holes that are in the halo of our galaxy, and they don't see the effect. So, so it's kind of been a, I wouldn't say definitively eliminated, but it's been eliminated, uh, it, it's been, been put down as, not likely to be the, the source of the dark matter. But very, very, good, uh, very good suggestion, though. I think it's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also, you know, when, when we talk, when, when we give these public talks, I'm amazed that the audience that comes to public talks asks better questions than when we give a talk in front of an astronomy department's faculty. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm absolutely serious. Much better questions. <laughs> I guess we have to wrap up, you're saying? Okay, well, thanks very, very much. I've been very attentive. Thank you very much.